This continent of ours is a very old patch of dirt, but as a nation, we're brand new. In many ways, we're still uncovering some of our early history. I've been working for the last two or three years on a particular project about a Lieutenant Nixon. Way back in England in 1834, there was an article in an English newspaper that talked about him. And apparently, he was a member of a party that came in through Northern Australia and did an expedition right down into Central Australia. I'll read you what he found out, or what he claims he found out. He met down there a colony of Dutch people. Unfortunately, he could speak Dutch, and this is what he said. From a few expressions in old Dutch which he uttered, I gathered some particulars, namely that he belonged to a small community all as white as himself. He said about 300, that they lived in houses enclosed all together within a great wall to defend them from the black men. That their fathers came there about 170 years ago from a distant land across the great sea. Now, if this is true, that means we've got white settlement in Australia over 100 years before the first fleet. For a long time, we were taught that the British were the only white settlers of this country. But for me, the possibility of an earlier Dutch settlement changes everything. What got me started was an article in this newspaper, The Leeds Mercury dated 1834. It was the largest provincial newspaper in England and often published reports of geographical exploration. On January the 25th, this extract from Lieutenant Nixon's journal appeared. Nixon's alleged discovery of a white colony was not on the northern shore, but 800 kilometres inland, near the middle of the Tanami Desert in the Northern Territory. For me, the article raises so many unanswered questions. Who was Lieutenant Nixon? And what happened to his journal, which has never been found? What I find really fascinating about this Nixon report, if it's true, is the fact that it would tend to explain a whole bunch of things that were picked up in Central Australia last century. Things like John McDowell Stewart coming through there and he encountered an Aboriginal who gave him a Masonic sign. And then he found a footprint that he reckoned was white though. And Charles Winnicky, he was another explorer poking around there. He encountered one day an Aboriginal who gave him the word, yeah, the yes. Strange stuff. According to Nixon, he was part of an expedition that sailed to Australia, to Coburg Peninsula, east of Darwin. In Nixon's day, there was no Darwin, but for years the British government had been trying to set up a permanent base along the northern coast. At Raffles Bay in 1827, they built a small outpost called Fort Wellington. It was their second attempt at a northern port, but it didn't last long. When Nixon's party arrived here on the 10th of April 1832, Fort Wellington had been deserted for three years. Out there in the bay would have been the big ship which had just arrived from Singapore. And the men would have been ferried up this little cutting here. <laughs> 
This cutting was put here because this is the site of the old abandoned Fort Wellington. And they cut it in there so that the boats could beach themselves and the stores could be unloaded. Nixon's mob would have used it as well. But the really interesting thing about the whole saga is the fact that it was totally secret. And here we are, 160 odd years later, trying to unravel the detail. The task of the expedition was to look for commercial and geographical possibilities. In other words, anything that could bring fame or fortune. Unfortunately, we don't even know who was in command or how many men were involved. So what do we know about this Lieutenant Nixon? Not much, I'm afraid, not even a first name or even an initial. But if we look at all the British records for the British Army and the Royal Navy and the Indian Army, we've got something like 28 Lieutenant Nixons in uniform at the time. It's not all that bad, actually, when you think about it, because there's a few things we can do to sort out the sheep from the goats. So you've got to remember that Singapore was actually owned and operated and run by the East India Company, and they had their own army. And that gets rid of the, the British Army fellows and the the Royal Navy lieutenants as well. Within the Indian Army, there were three separate armies, Bombay, Bengal, and Madras. Singapore was garrisoned by the troops from Madras. And within the Madras Army, we got four Lieutenant Nixons. Of those four Lieutenant Nixons, one of them was a pensioner, so we can scratch him off the list. Another one was back in England getting married. That's him gone. The last two were both called Richard Nixon. Whichever Nixon it was, his expedition would have skirted the Arnold Land Escarpment and headed into the dry interior of the Territory. These men were real explorers, moving through unknown country, looking for anything that could make a quid. I'm searching for evidence of Nixon's expedition. Just up ahead here is a junction of two creeks, which I reckon's worth having a look at. But on the way, I'll just show you something. What I'm looking for around here, there's one over here, but usually you get some of this mistletoe hanging around here. That's a mima. And it's got a real survival cycle all of its own, which is fascinating. Here it is here with the little fruit hanging off it. There we go. Very really sort of translucent -y, sticky sort of stuff it is. Quite sweet too. But there's a seed in the middle of all this, and what happens is that the birds come along and eat this stuff here, and the seed gets stuck on the end of their beak, so they fly away to a tree and wipe their beak up and down on the branch, dislodge the, the seed again, and bang, up it comes again. The whole cycle repeats itself. There's more mistletoe around here than I've seen for ages. There's been some recent rain and that's made a big difference. That stuff there, that really typifies what's going on here at the moment. This is the ruby salt bush and it's called that because of these little red fruit that it gets. Looking a bit like rubies, which you can eat. The really amazing thing about this right now is the, the lush greenness. Normally you get round here, and these things are a sort of a dull bluey grey looking colour and all the rest of it, but it's really come alive right now because of this rainfall around the place. Nice and soft and lush, terrific stuff. In fact, looking around the countryside right now, I've never seen it better in all the time that I've been poking through here. For the early explorers, had they known about it, 
Bush Tucker would have been a great asset because surviving out here is tough. You find some funny marks on trees around the place. I think this one here is natural, but 140 years ago, the explorer Augustus Gregory came through here and he came to this spot here, junction of two creeks. And what he found here was absolutely amazing. He found the remains of a large camp. Trees like this had all been cut down and reach poles erected and all that sort of thing. It was pretty old, it was about eight years old, he reckoned. I don't know, I think it might have been a little bit older than that. He looked around the camp, trying to find whose camp it might be, who carved their initials in the side. People like Leichhardt, for instance, did that all the time with all their camps. He looked for animal bones, because people like Leichhardt carted bullocks with them. Couldn't find anything, nothing at all. But he still figured that, well, Leichhardt's the only person who's been through here. Has to be his camp, because no one else had been operating in the area. Well, we know how the Indian Army operates when they do things like this. What they did was they'd move south and they'd establish a depot, a base camp. And from that, they'd radiate out. Then they'd send the rest of the party further down, establish another one, do the same thing again. And what I'm wondering is that perhaps this, that camp that Gregory found, was one of those depots. The one thing we do know is that if Nixon's story is true, then he definitely did pass through this area. From here, Nixon's expedition continued south. They travelled over 800 kilometres in a month, the last part through the Tanami Desert, a hot, flat, featureless place. We don't know what role Lieutenant Nixon played in the expedition. But we do know that one day he climbed a hill, which was later named Mount Singapore by the expedition. I suspect he was up there to get a reading of latitude and longitude, using a sextant. But when he looked to the south, he made a remarkable discovery. I'll just read you something from his journal here. May the 15th, 1832. On reaching the summit of the hill, no words can express the astonishment I felt at the magical change of scenery. After having travelled for so many days over nothing but barren hills and parching plains and having to dig for water every day, I saw below me a low and level country through which a broad sheet of water extended. Nixon claims that he saw small boats gliding through a maze of narrow channels and people fishing with nets. On the opposite shore, he could see a cluster of houses in a grove of trees. He reckoned he'd discovered a settlement of 300 Dutch people in the middle of Australia. According to his journal, Nixon and his party stayed eight days and learned about the history and lifestyle of his Dutch descendants. Nixon was the last European to ever see this community. No one knows what became of the Dutch and the remains of their village have never been seen since. <laughs>